Good evening. My name is Dominic Canonico, and on behalf of the Center for Ethics and Culture, I'd like to welcome you to the second installment of this year's Catholic Literature Series. Each fall since 2002, the Center for Ethics and Culture has sponsored this event, featuring four lectures that focus on literature in light of the Catholic tradition. The series emerged from the Center's hope to expose the Notre Dame community to the rich Catholic literary heritage and to examine the role of literature in our society. This year's Catholic Literature Series will focus on children's literature. Though most undergraduates probably grew up reading or hearing children's literature, many have likely not explored the unique ways in which it captures the imagination and innocence. This series will discuss individual works of children's literature and explore the significance of children's literature in our society. Before I introduce our speaker, please mark your calendars for the next lecture in our series scheduled for Tuesday, October 15th. Megan Cox Gurdon of the Wall Street Journal will be joining us to discuss young adult literature. I should also mention that there will be a sheet going around during the lecture to sign up for emails from the Center for Ethics and Culture if you're interested. Tonight we welcome John O'Callaghan, Professor of Philosophy here at, at the University of Notre Dame. Professor O'Callaghan received his PhD from Notre Dame in 1996. In 1998, he became an assistant professor at Creighton University serving there for three years before joining faculty at the University of Portland as an associate professor. In 2003, Professor O'Callaghan returned to Notre Dame to become director of the Jacques Maritain Center. He has also been appointed a permanent member of the Pontifical Academy of St. Thomas Aquinas. Tonight he will discuss Harry Potter and the King's Cross. Please join me in welcoming Professor John O'Callaghan. sure this is position right to pick up my voice. Can everyone hear? No? no. <laughs> Must be a student in my class. Um, yeah. Let me begin by thanking the Center for Ethics and Culture and its director, uh, Carter Sneed, for inviting me to uh, speak here, and in particular, Stephen Fredozo, who does all the actual work in the center. Um, and <laughs> as well as Ryan, um, who does a little bit of work. Um, especially when Carter's around, Ryan does some work. Um, but I want to thank him for inviting me to be part of this series. Uh, I think this is probably one of the most important things that the Center for Ethics and Culture does uh, at the University of Notre Dame. And in fact, I think it's one of the most important things that goes on at the University of Notre Dame, particularly with regard to the university as a center of Catholic education. So thank you, Carter, for uh, sponsoring this um, series and my lecture. I'd also like to thank J.K. Rowling for the size of the crowd. Uh, <laughs> I'm a little intimidated. Um, and I hope you'll be a little bit patient because it will take me a little while to get to the novels. I'm going to do some background, and it's going to be about philosophy. And um, at the end, by the way, uh, if somebody wants to know, I'll give you a story about that picture. Um, but in any case, it's going to take a bit to get there because I want to place the novels against the background of the tradition of philosophy in uh, Western society. So my thesis this evening is that the Harry Potter series is a tale of two loves, an allegory of the Christian life in search of wisdom. The American publisher of the novels changed the British title of the first book from Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone to Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, because it was thought that American children would never read a book with philosophy in the title. <laughs> Apparently, British children are much more sophisticated than all of you. <laughs> but this change is unfortunate, because it may mislead readers into thinking that the novels are fundamentally about sorcery and witches. In fact, a key to understanding their theme is to recognize that Harry is never actually saved by the ordinary magic of the sorcerer's world. In the first novel, he is saved by the eternal love of his mother. In the second, he is saved by his faith in Dumbledore. In the third, he is saved by his thirst for justice that overcomes the vengeful de desires of Sirius Black, who says that he wants to commit the murder I was imprisoned for. In the fourth book, he is saved by his act of self-sacrifice. In the fifth and sixth novels, he is again saved by the sacrificial acts of others. 
Finally, in the seventh novel, he is saved by his own willingness to walk the way of the king's cross. No, the novels are not a tale of ordinary magic. They are a tale of extraordinary magic, exploring a tale of two loves, the love of power, which is a philosophy of domination, and wealth versus the love of a wisdom that puts one in the presence of divine love. Students of philosophy learn very early that the Greek etymology of philosophy is the love of wisdom. And the primal philosophical question for this love of wisdom is what wisdom consists in, the love of power or the love of truth, a love that dominates uh, and subordinates others to itself or a love that sacrifices itself for others. In order to recognize this conflict of the two philosophical loves in the novels, it's necessary for me to describe very briefly the themes in Western philosophy that I have in mind. And I hope you will be patient with me for a bit, since I need to spend a little time talking about the nature of philosophy before getting to the fun of the stories. Historically, we can contrast two broad approaches to philosophical wisdom. On the one hand, we have the tradition that stems from Greek figures like Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, as well as the later Christians, Augustine and Thomas Aquinas, among others. On the other hand, we have modern figures like Rene Descartes, Immanuel Kant, and most especially Friedrich Nietzsche. In defense of his life, Socrates proclaimed that his wisdom consisted in his knowledge that he did not genuinely know anything, and thus did not claim to know anything. While the powerful of Athenian society, the politicians, the poets, and the craftsmen claimed to have knowledge but clearly didn't. So we learn from Socrates that the love of wisdom begins with a recognition of one's own ignorance and the failure of those around one to properly educate and discipline one towards genuine wisdom and character. This Socratic tradition places emphasis upon the goal and source of wisdom as transcending the ordinary human experience of the mundane. In Aristotle's words, it is a participation in something divine. The goal of philosophy is happiness, found primarily in loving union with and contemplation of something other than oneself. And only secondarily, if at all, in the possession of riches, fame, glory, honor, and power. Plato will describe genuine wisdom as the knowledge of the highest cause of things, causes of things, that allows one to put order into one's own life and order into the world around one. One begins the love of wisdom in a state of ignorance and weakness and aspires to attain through knowledge a kind of power over one's life because of one's union with the transcendent or divine. So this tradition also places emphasis upon philosophy as a way of life, a discipline of body and mind. Not the control of others, but self-control and the development of virtues, particularly justice, temperance, courage, and prudence. Finally, it places an emphasis upon the social conditions necessary for pursuing this discipline. It requires a community of inquirers. A central feature of these social conditions is the need for a guide or master of the discipline who can show one the way and inculcate in one the habits of mind and body required by it. Socrates' problem was the inability to find an appropriate guide in Athenian society. So he came to grief in the view of most Athenians with his trial and subsequent er, execution. So if you haven't read it yet, I just gave away the story. But to the consternation and wonder of his friends, he welcomed his death as providing him with that transcendent setting in which he could acquire genuine wisdom and happiness. Death comes to us all. Again, I've just given away the story. It's going to come to all of you. Wealth, fame, honor, and power simply serve as distractions in this life to help us forget this central fact. They are fleeting shadows that give us the appearance of immortality, not the reality. In his famous words, 
which will prove very important for our understanding of Harry Potter, Socrates tells his friends that philosophy is not preparation for life, that is, preparation for success in society, wealth, fame, glory, power, and so on. Rather, philosophy, the love of wisdom, is nothing other than preparation for death. Some might object to this portrait of Socrates' quest for wisdom in quasi-religious and social terms. After all, he was accused of not believing in the gods of Athens, and he alienated himself from Athenian society in what can look like a solitary pursuit of wisdom. On the contrary, his problem was the inability to find a wise teacher whom he could trust, not with the very idea of a teacher in whom one must place one's faith. He refers to the divine inner voice that guided him away from misguided courses of action, with the result that he led a life that increasingly placed him in conflict with the powerful. Here I would remind you of the ways in which Harry always seems to be getting into trouble with teachers at Hogwarts, particularly those who claim to be able to teach the defense against the dark arts, who claim a certain knowledge but more often have no clue what they are doing as well as the general incompetence of the Ministry of Magic itself. In his allegory of the cave, Plato has a prisoner freed and compelled to leave the cave of ignorance. In dramatic fashion, the mysterious figure who is capable of successfully compelling the prisoner to leave is not described by Plato, other than that he succeeds in compelling the prisoner. Paradoxically, the prisoner is compelled to be free. I want you to focus on that phrase compelled to be free. He cannot achieve freedom alone. Often when the allegory is taught, and some of you may actually have had it taught to you this way, often when the allegory is taught, instructors will tend to pass over in silence this compulsion to enlightenment at the hands of another. As an embarrassment to the freedom and autonomy of the individual searching for wisdom, it seems the inquirer should find his or her own way out of the cave if he or she is to be genuinely free and autonomous. For these teachers of the allegory, any teaching is a form of slavery. On their account, freedom precedes truth and is the condition for its discovery. But on Plato's account, freedom is subsequent to the truth. Veritas vos liberabit, the truth, the truth will set you free. Socrates' quest went unfulfilled in this life there's a sense in which Socrates was guilty, for his life showed that in practice the contemporary gods of Athens were those who held power, the politicians, the poets, and the craftsmen. He did not bow down and worship before them. His mission was divine. But it did not involve the gods of this world. He came to understand that what the oracle, who had said he was the wisest of all Athenians, despite his sense that he knew nothing, he came to understand what the oracle meant, namely that the wisdom of this world, the love of power, is not wisdom at all. And thus the real love of wisdom is preparation for death. Seen in the light of Socrates' defense, the enigmatic figure in the allegory of the cave who frees the prisoner and compels him to leave appears to be something divine. This idea is shown by the conclusion of the allegory of the cave when the prisoner tries to return to save others. Because of his human weakness, the powers of this world resist him, and he is killed by those others he would save. The philosopher must be prepared to die for his love. Initially, some early Christians encountering the Greek philosophical tradition had difficulty trying to understand what looked like a completely independent tradition and source of wisdom and happiness, a source that appeared to many as a rival to the Christian scriptural wisdom brought to fulfillment in the incarnation of Christ. Others, however, took their inspiration from St. Paul's encounter with the Greek philosophers in the Areopagus, and his statement that the things of God are clearly seen in the created order of the world. So among others, when Augustine and later Aquinas encountered this Greek tradition, of philosophical wisdom, they welcomed it. 
Their response was to see in Greek wisdom the striving of the human spirit after a transcendent source of happiness. They saw in it the best that human nature could do on its own. The Greek love of wisdom displayed the human yearning for eternal happiness. And so Greek philosophy foreshadows, indeed unknowingly longs for, the wisdom revealed in Christ. But they also saw in it its ultimate failure. Human efforts alone cannot instill the virtues necessary for arriving at happiness. With the death of the philosopher re-entering the cave, Plato himself hinted at this in the allegory. Christian wisdom, by contrast, meets and surpasses all of the criteria of wisdom laid down by the Greek tradition. Justice, temperance, courage, and prudence must be transformed by faith, hope, and charity. Ultimate wisdom must be seen in unmistakably religious terms. A God revealed through the incarnation of Christ fulfills the longing the Greeks could never satisfy. Plato leaves us with the curious figure of the oracle and the enigmatic figure who frees the prisoner from the cave, while Aristotle gives us the ambiguity of this something akin to the divine. The early, medi early and medieval Christians also affirmed that the truth will set you free. But for Augustine and Aquinas, Christ compels them with, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In short, the Greeks asked human questions about wisdom that only the incarnation could adequately answer. One last thing before getting to the other love we see portrayed in the novels. We have to say something about the role of faith in the quest for wisdom. Augustine tells us that natural faith permeates our lives. Far from excluding the exercise of reason, it makes reason possible for us. What would our lives of reason be like if we did not have faith in our teachers? How would we learn math or physics or history? Natural faith in a teacher is the light by which we begin to see the truth in any area of study. The difficulty is that we have no way of knowing for certain in the midst of our learning that our teachers are good or bad. If we did, we would have no need of them. The most striking example that St. Augustine gives us is his mother, Monica. What would our understanding of ourselves be like if we did not know who our fathers are? And yet, without a kind of natural faith placed in our mothers, we cannot know this crucial fact of our lives. So our knowledge of who we are and where we came from cannot do away with her role in our lives. Our natural faith in our mothers enables us to understand ourselves. Think, by contrast, of the confused state in which Harry Potter lives, bereft of knowledge of his parents, because he has had no chance to learn from them. In this way, faith in one's mother is, for Augustine, the closest natural analog to religious faith. And yet, religious faith is qualitatively different. In religious faith, one places one's faith in a transcendent being. Now, consider, by contrast, the modern view of philosophy. I'm a Thomist. And uh, those of you who don't know yet will find out if you study philosophy that Thomists always blame Descartes. <laughs> Consider by contrast the modern view of philosophy that we inherit from Descartes, Kant, and Nietzsche. These figures share many of the aspirations of ancient philosophy. The key difference is the abandonment of the quest for transcendence and the rejection of faith in teachers or guides along the way. Descartes finds a place for God, but only as a deus ex machina to get him out of the web of his own confused ideas and guarantee the truth of his judgments about the world. The goal of philosophy for him is primarily practical, not contemplative. He promises that through his method, one will become the master of nature, a professor, uh, sorry, a possessor of bodily health, and moral perfection or blessedness. Yes, Virginia, you really can achieve blessedness all on your own. The first step toward wisdom is to treat everything that one has learned from teachers as false. 
until one can show it to be true by one's own efforts alone. Teaching has enslaved one. Faith, natural or supernatural, excludes reason and is blind. If you've ever heard the, fra the phrase faith or reason, that's not medieval. That's modern. One has to return into the cave of one's own mind and free oneself before arriving at truth. If Shakespeare says, first thing we do, let's kill all the lawyers, Descartes demurs with, first thing I do, I'll kill all the teachers. I don't need no education. I don't need no thought control. <laughs> no dark sarcasm in the classroom. Hey, teacher, leave me alone. But I digress. Kant echoes Descartes' rationalist approach when he proclaims that enlightenment only comes to those who have strong, a strong enough will and the courage to throw off the yoke of tutelage, by which one has enslaved one's mind to another, to a teacher. Only then, one can, only then can one act autonomously in pursuit of enlightenment. It's no surprise in this setting that the medieval marriage of philosophy and religious faith that we saw in Augustine and Aquinas breaks down. By and large, for the last 400 years, the most powerful current in modern philosophy has seen it as a kind of willful rationality at war with religious faith and a competing wisdom to the wisdom of Christ. Finally, and gloriously, it is Nietzsche who clearly sees this modern transformation as a tale of two loves except that he sees it more as a war of two wills. Nietzsche perceives in this modern tradition of philosophy the exaltation of the individual will. While the ancient and medieval tradition I described was intrinsically social because one needed a guide to a life of beatitude and union with God, this modern tradition is intrinsically solitary because it is precisely the guidance of others that limits and constrains one's autonomous freedom and enlightenment. At the heart of Descartes and Kant's love of wisdom for Nietzsche is the force of individual will that throws off the yoke of being taught by another. One must go it alone. The truth will not set you free, but rather your freedom will enable you to discover the truth by yourself alone. For Nietzsche, the power of truth is now an instrument in pursuit of this primal power of autonomous will. Indeed, it's a short step for Nietzsche to recognize that one's own power of will does not even lead to the truth. It creates the truth. This particular theme that Nietzsche pursues is crucial for our understanding of the second love portrayed in the Potter novels, the love of power. Nietzsche tells us that there's no good and evil, only power and those with the will to use it. No truth that is not secretly the will to power. Nietzsche explains what he takes the true, meaning, the true nature of philosophy to be, not the contemplative activity of the ancients and medievals, loving and participating in the transcendent or divine, but a creative will that pushes aside their God with a kind of magnificence, and when you read this, it's truly magnificent, or maybe I'm just odd, with a kind of magnificence that even those of us who are religious believers can marvel at, he writes that, and I quote, genuine philosophers are commanders and legislators. They say, thus it shall be. With a creative hand, they reach for the future, and all that is and has been becomes means for them, an instrument, a hammer. Their knowing is creating. They're creating is a legislation. Their will to truth is will to power. What is good? Everything that heightens the feeling of power in man, the will to power, power itself. What is bad? Everything that is born of weakness. What is happiness? The feeling that power is growing, that resistance is overcome. End of quotation. Philosophy is not a general or abstract will for mankind to become the master of nature. It is my will to become master of all, to kill God and thus become a God. 
This is a love that sees wisdom in consuming and destroying those who compete with one for power as a way of manifesting one's own dignity. And anticipating a little bit, whom does that sound like in the novels? Now, after testing your patience with this greatly oversimplified version of a rich and complex, complex history of over 2,000 years, in seven pages, eight pages, it's time to talk about how the Harry Potter, Potter, how the Harry Potter novels portray this competition of rival loves. The love of power versus the love that manifests itself in preparation for death and sacrifice that is an image of the divine. The first thing to note is that Rowling clearly points us toward a medieval and religious setting for our understanding of philosophy. Consider her use of Latin for the language in which spells are cast. Consider also the rich religious symbols she uses. There's Lucius Malfoy, that is Lucifer. His last name in French means bad or evil faith, Malfoy. He places his faith in what is evil, Voldemort. His son's name, Draco, just means snake in Latin. <laughs> we have Slytherin House, again the snake. By contrast, we have Gryffindor House. Gryffindor is French for golden griffin, Gryffindor. I try to, I try to, I was saying at dinner, I was, I was saying at dinner, I should do that again, I was saying at dinner that um, if you try to pronounce uh, French, the key is to try to say it like Pepe Le Pew. Um, and I don't think I succeeded there. Gryffindor. The griffin is a medieval symbol of Christ because of its two natures, the eagle and the lion, each of which separately were taken to be symbols of Christ and the resurrection. We have the four friends of the third novel, the prisoner of Azkaban, the Animagi, who can take on the form of animals. Lupin, Lupin, the wolf. The wolf is a symbol in religious art of poverty in St. Francis because he adopted the wolf of Gubbio. You can Google it on your iPhones. A wolf that had been driven out of Gubbio by the citizens. The association with St. Francis is apt when we think of Professor Lupin's ill health and the rags he wears for clothes. There's Sirius Black, the dog who symbolically represents watchfulness and fidelity. A Dalmatian is often used in religious art as a symbol of St. Dominic and is associated with the Dominicans who are known as the Black Friars because of the black capes they wear over their white religious habits. The Franciscans and Dominicans were founded at nearly the same time in the High Middle Ages, and for similar reasons, to live lives of evangelical poverty that more clearly manifested the lessons of the Gospels than the worldly lives being led by many of the powerful in the church and in society. Finally, there's the villain of the third book, Peter Pettigrew, the rat, a medieval symbol of destruction and evil. Pettigrew is the one who grew small, not just physically, but spiritually as well. Most striking of the four animagi of the third book is Prongs. Unbeknownst to Harriet is his father in the form of a stag who appears when he utters the Patronus spell. Recall that Harry is passing out, about to be overcome by the kiss of a Dementor. As he's passing out, Harry hears the screams of his mother, presumably recalling the screams he heard as an infant when she was murdered at the hands of Voldemort. In Latin, Patronus means defender or advocate, and it is etymol etymologically linked with the Latin for father. In Latin, expecto means, as you might think, I await, a waiting that may be tinged with hope. It will be familiar to Christians in the room, if there are any. In the Latin version of the Nicene Creed, expecto resurrectionum mortuorum et vitam eternam. So the spell expecto patronum means I await a defender. I hope for an advocate. 
It turns out that the answer to Harry's prayer is a Patronus reminiscent of Prongs, his father. Harry's saved by this prayer and then sees himself standing next to the stag on the, banks across, on the bank across the lake. Later, Dumbledore explains, your father is alive in you, Harry, and shows himself most plainly when you have need of him. How else could you produce that particular Patronus? Prongs rode again last night. With this image of the stag by the waterside, consider Psalm 42. As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. In religious symbolism, the deer or stag represents piety and religious aspiration, solitude and purity of life. Of course, there are countless more such animal symbols, but the most striking of all of them is perhaps the unicorn that is slaughtered by Voldemort in the Philosopher's Stone. The unicorn in medieval art was a symbol of purity. The legend had it that only a virgin could capture a unicorn. The unicorn would run to the virgin, lay its head in her lap, and fall asleep. Thus the unicorn and the virgin were personified as symbols of Christ and the Virgin Mary. When Hagrid and the children tell Ronan the centaur that a unicorn has been injured in the forest, Ronan responds by saying, always the innocent are the first victims. So it has been for ages past, so it is now. His words remind the reader of the slaughter of the holy innocents. What is intriguing in the Philosopher's Stone is Rowling's addition of a symbolic element that's not historically an explicit part of the legend. Namely, that the blood of the unicorn gives life. But to slaughter a unicorn and drink its blood is a monstrous crime. Another centaur explains to Harry, only one who has nothing to lose and everything to gain would commit such a crime. The blood of a unicorn will keep you alive even if you are an inch from death but at a terrible price. You have slain something pure and defenseless to save yourself. And you will have but a half-life, a cursed life, from the moment the blood touches your lips. This idea of drinking the blood of the slaughtered unicorn is a stark foil for the free offering that Christians believe Christ makes of his blood for their salvation. Voldemort steals it, while Christ freely gives it. Again, we are told in Corinthians, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Now consider the scene involving the second unicorn found in the forest. Harry observes Voldemort slaughtering the unicorn and drinking its blood. The lightning bolt on his forehead begins to throb with excruciating pain, and he passes out. This scene is the turning point of the first novel. It's designed to remind us of the murder of Harry's parents, for Harry received the scar when Voldemort tried to kill him. His mother's love saved him then and reduced Voldemort to the shadowy existence he now has. Dramatically, the scene pivots us forward and foreshadows the climax of the novel when Voldemort will once again try to kill Harry. In that climactic scene, he's grabbed by Voldemort in the Janus-faced form of Professor Quirrell. And, quotation, at once a needle-sharp pain seared across Harry's scar, his head felt as though it was about to split in two, as earlier it had felt when he saw the unicorn slaughtered. Voldemort tries to strangle Harry, but his hands are burned. Harry, sensing that this is the way to defeat him, throws himself upon Voldemort. Eventually, Harry passes out from the pain in his scar, as he had done earlier when he saw the slaughtering of the unicorn. Later, Dumbledore explains that your mother died to save you. If there's one thing Voldemort cannot understand, it is love. He didn't realize that love as powerful as your mother's for you leaves its own mark. Not a scar, no visible sign, to have been loved so deeply, even though the person who loved us is gone, will give us some protection forever. 
It is in your very skin. It was agony to touch a person marked by something so good. Harry's mother's name is Lily, another medieval symbol of purity and innocence, as well as, as of the Virgin Mary in religious art. Just look at old stained glass windows. You'll see all of these in the stained glass windows. Here it's associated with the purity and innocence of the unicorn. Harry is the unicorn who cannot be slaughtered because of the lily-like purity of his mother's love. Thus, Rowling clearly places the reader's imagination in a medieval world in which things, particularly living things, are filled with meaning and symbolic force. It is the world of Augustine, for whom the things of this world were always signs, taking the attentive mind to God. It was because the world is charged with the glory of God that will shine out like shook foil that Augustine thought serious philosophical inquiry into the world, pointed one to and helped one understand the wisdom that comes from the revelation of the incarnation of God. It's a world in which religious aspirations are married to the Greek love of wisdom, faith seeking understanding, with the question of love at its core. So this symbolic setting provides the key for understanding the role of philosophy, not sorcery, in the story. The two traditions I described above are represented by the different destinies of Nicholas Flamel, who, by the way, was a historical person. Nicholas Flamel, the possessor of the philosopher's stone, and Voldemort, the one who is seeking to possess it. The idea for the Philosopher's Stone also comes to us from the Middle Ages. It was the alchemist's holy grail. If acquired, it would provide the ability to transform ordinary lead into gold and thus provide untold wealth as well as the, the elixir of eternal life. The alchemical desire to acquire it presages Descartes' methodal, methodical quest for wealth and bodily health through an active philosophical wisdom. It functions as a symbol of the modern technological drive that unchecked may end up transforming and even destroying human nature itself. Though called the philosopher's stone, it's entirely foreign and opposed to the philosophical quest as we see it among the ancients, as well as Augustine and Aquinas. Their goal, their goal was contemplative, seeking a loving union with something divine. It, on the other hand, represents the apex of practicality. It is technological, something imminent and mundane. It represents the seed of the transformation, indeed rejection of the ancient philosophical tradition, wrought by the development of modern technology. It's not a love of the transcendent, but of the imminent, the love of worldly power. Rowling emphasizes the feature of the stone that provides eternal life. In that respect, it forms a dramatic counterweight to the blood of the unicorn, which she has similarly described as a source of eternal life. But while the unicorn is a living creature, the philosopher's stone is a dead weight. Notice that Voldemort's name means the will to death or desire for death, combining voluntas, the Latin for will, and de mort, French for of death. But he does not will death for himself. He wants the eternal life that he believes the philosopher's stone will grant him. Indeed, he wills the death of others as the means of this eternal life. That's why he slaughtered the unicorn and tried to slaughter Harry. Voldemort is obsessed by this, his quest for the philosopher's stone. In the climactic scene of the first book, he explains to Harry that ideas of good and evil are youthful and ridiculous. He says, there's no good and evil. There's only power and those too weak to seek it. Now remember your Nietzsche. Voldemort is simply paraphrasing Nietzsche. And yet, as we've seen, the communion of sacrificial love with his mother protects Harry and conquers the quest for unfettered power. Despite Voldemort's Nietzschean claim and quest, good triumphs over evil in the clash of these two loves. Now consider Nicholas Flamel. 
Is he really any different from Voldemort? He has the philosopher's stone. It has brought him untold wealth and everlasting life. Certainly his means for achieving this goal are different from, from Voldemort's. His means are technological, as he is the one to have developed it. Voldemort's means are morally vicious, as he tries to steal it, killing all those who would stand in his way. And yet their ultimate desire is at root the same, to have control over the world around them, indeed over life and death itself. Wealth, health, and blessedness, the goal of Descartes' search for wisdom that begins in the symbolic killing of one's teachers. Flamel and Voldemort share the same love, even as they have pursued it in different ways. But under the tutelage of Dumbledore, Flamel's final destiny is quite different from Voldemort's. Dumbledore explains at the end of the first novel that Nicholas has come to understand the lifeness, lifelessness of the everlasting life granted by the lifeless stone. It's not a genuine life, but an eternal living death. Dumbledore explains that the stone has been destroyed and that after he has set his fares in order, Nicholas will die. He tells Harry that it is the goal shared by Nicholas and Voldemort that is in fact at the heart of their problem. It's a common evil despite the different means they choose to pursue it. It does not really matter that the precious metal of the technological means chosen by Nicholas is in itself morally neutral, for its neutrality is destroyed by the base metal of the goal, the will to power. It remains lead for the soul, weighing it down, even as it produces gold for the body that lightens its worldly burden. Dumbledore says, you know, the stone was really not such a wonderful thing. As much money and life as you could want, the two things most human beings would choose above all the trouble is, humans do have a knack of choosing precisely those things that are worst for them. Thus, the unlimited power of the lifeless stone that Nicholas possesses and Voldemort seeks is not the real fruit of philosophy, as Nietzsche would have it. On the contrary, Dumbledore says, after all, to the well-organized mind, death is but the next adventure. This is the wisdom that Harry takes from Dumbledore. Coming right on the heel of Voldemort's reference to Nietzsche's portrait of philosophy as a will to power, Dumbledore's statement is nothing other than a counter-reference to Socrates' portrait of philosophy as preparation for death and the transcendence that comes with it. Wisdom is not to be found in a lifeless stone. The genuine lover of wisdom must be prepared to die for it, Voldemort is Nietzsche, Harry is Socrates. And Dumbledore is the teacher teaching a lesson about love that Harry has to learn if he is to be happy. This medieval lesson about love discovered in faith seeking understanding appears ever more clearly if we concentrate upon the relationship between Harry and the divine mission of Dumbledore. Recall that the mythic symbol of Dumbledore is the phoenix Again, uh, sorry, uh, recall that the mythic symbol of Dumbledore is the phoenix. Again, a medieval symbol of Christ because of its ability to rise from the ashes on the third day after it has been consumed in a holocaust. It is the phoenix, Fox, who comes to Harry in the Chamber of Secrets when he recalls Dumbledore's promise to him. Earlier, as Dumbledore was being relieved of his duties and led away from Hogwarts, he had proclaimed that he would remain at Hogwarts as long as someone there thinks of him. The moment that Harry recalls this promise in the Chamber of Secrets, the phoenix appears. Fox gives Harry the gifts of the sorting hat and the sword of Godric Gryffindor, with which he will slay the basilisk. I've already noted that Gryffindor means golden griffin, a symbol of Christ. The name Godric is an old English name that means the power of God. So we have in the scene the association of two symbols of Christ, the phoenix and the griffin. And the gift of the sword that the phoenix gives to Harry is the power of God, the power of Christ. My daughter Caroline reminded me yesterday that this religious symbolism is confirmed in the seventh book 
when Harry looks into the frozen pool and sees what appears to him as, quote, a great silver cross. It's the sword of Godric Gryffindor lying at the bottom of the forest pool. So, next slide. Now, the Latin Vulgate of Psalm 90, which describes how the just will reside under the protection of God, says, super aspidem et basiliscum calcabis. Anybody? <laughs> you will tread upon the asp and the basilisk. The basilisk is a symbol of Satan. To look into the eyes of the basilisk will turn one into stone. The sorting hat is used at the beginning of each school to sort out the new students into the houses, most befitting the seeds of character within them. So here in the Chamber of Secrets, the sorting hat represents Harry's moral character, as well as his faith in Dumbledore that protects him from this petrifying gaze of the basilisk. And yet because of Falk's battle with the basilisk, Harry looked, quote, Harry looked straight into its face and saw that its eyes, both its great bulbous yellow eyes, had been punctured by the phoenix. The phoenix blinds the beast so that Harry can slay it with the sword of Godric Gryffindor. Slay it with the power of Christ. Most striking of all, the phoenix weeps on the basilisk's poisonous bite and keeps Harry from dying. Now players of the game Trivial Pursuit, any of you play Trivial Pursuit? A few. It was big when I was young. <laughs> players of the game Trivial Pur Pursuit will remember that the answer to the question, what is the shortest verse of the Bible, is Jesus wept. And that verse, Jesus wept, comes just before Christ raises Lazarus from the dead. Listen to the words of the novel. He felt the bird lay its beautiful head on the spot where the serpent's fang had pierced him. You're dead, Harry Potter, said, Vol I'm going to say Voldemort instead of Tom Riddle, said Voldemort's voice above him. Dead. Even Dumbledore's bird knows it. Do you see what he's doing, Potter? He's crying. Harry blinked. Fawkes' head slid in and out of focus. Thick, pearly tears were trickling down the glossy feathers. So ends the famous Harry Potter, said Voldemort's distant voice. Alone in the Chamber of Secrets, forsaken by his friends, defeated at last by the Dark Lord he so unwisely challenged. You'll be back with your dear mother soon, Harry. If this is dying, thought Harry, it's not so bad. Even the pain was leaving him. But was he dying? Instead of going black, the chamber seemed to be coming back into focus. Harry gave his head a little shake, and there was Fox, still resting his head on Harry's arm. A pearly patch of tears was shining all around the wound, except there was no wound. Voldemort had forgotten the healing powers of Phoenix Tears. Much like her use of the unicorn, Rowling has made the symbol of the Phoenix her own by transforming it. The restorative power of the tears of the phoenix is not part of the traditional symbol. And it is again a powerful symbolic contrast to the living death of the philosopher's stone. Genuine life, that is, genuine love, is often found more in the tears of life in misericordia than in untold riches and power. If you'll allow me, salve regina, mater misericordia. Vita dolcedo et spes nostra salve, ad te clamamus exules fili heve, ad te suspiramus gementes et flentes, in hoc lacrimarum vale. Lacrimarum, tears. Finally, it is by holding on to the tail feathers of the phoenix that Harry and his friends are flown out of that is delivered from the Chamber of Secrets as it is destroyed and crumbles about them. The entire scene is extraordinary. While most of Rowling's use of names, mythological beasts, and magical objects within the books is merely symbolic, bringing to mind religious and philosophical concepts, this scene combines a number of historical legends and is clearly allegorical. Harry is there to slay the basilisk and save Ginny Weasley, who has been possessed by the diary of Tom Riddle. 
Tom Riddle is none other than the memory of Voldemort's youth. The presence of Ginny, along with the manner in which Harry slays the basilisk by driving the sword into its mouth, is reminiscent of two medieval legends, the triumph of St. George and the exorcism of St. Trofino. Depicted, as it happens, as it happens, in two famous paintings in Venice by the 15th and 16th century artist Carpaccio. You have to, if you do French that way, you gotta do Italian that way, Carpaccio. In the first, St. George is presented as driving his lance into the mouth of the serpent to free the princess and her kingdom. In the legend of St. George, he is first bitten by the dragon and falls poisoned to the ground. However, he falls into a river, symbolic of the waters of baptism, which revive him, ultimately leading to his conquest of the beast. So we have the association of the river, the waters of the baptism, with the tears of the phoenix that similarly revive Harry from the bite of the basilisk. The exorcism of St. Trofino is from the same series of paintings. The painting depicts the legend in which the early church martyr, St. Trofino, is called upon to drive a demon out of the daughter of the emperor. He drives the demon into a basilisk and then confronts it, thus delivering the young girl from her possession. Harry's confrontation with the basilisk delivers Jenny from her possession by Voldemort. But notice how the scene also recalls Plato's allegory of the cave. When Harry enters the chamber, chamber of secrets, he's described as filled with great columns, it's described as filled with great columns carved in the shape of snakes, which rise to support a ceiling lost in darkness, casting long black shadows through the odd greenish gloom. In the allegory of the cave, the prisoner's ignorance consists in their obsession with the shadows cast about them by the fire that is behind them. And yet one of the enslaved is delivered from his bondage by another enigmatic figure who is not enslaved. Here, that figure is Fox, who stands in for Dumbledore. Finally, the scene recalls the allegorical harrowing of hell as it is portrayed in Dante's Divine Comedy. Voldemort, who commands the basilisk, is clearly associated with Satan. But recall that the Apostles' Creed speaks of Christ descending into hell and rising on the third day. In Dante's Inferno, hell has fallen into ruins from the earthquake that shook the earth upon Christ's death. The coming of Christ into hell was to retrieve the virtuous men and women of the Hebrew tradition, and hell could not withstand the fourth force of Christ's sacrificial love. Here the phoenix leads them out of the chamber of secrets as Christ led the virtuous out of hell. By her use of the phoenix, the sword of Godric Gryffindor and the basilisk, Rowling presents Dumbledore's teaching about sacrificial love as a clear allegorical figure of Christ's saving mission that rescues humanity from the shadows and illusions of the chamber of secrets rescues them from the cave of ignorance. It's an allegorical representation of where wisdom is to be found and how faith rescues one from ignorance and leads to understanding and ultimately a sacrificial love for one another. In the sixth book, Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince, Dumbledore makes it quite clear that the story is a story of the ancient argument about philosophy and the love of wisdom. He allows Harry to observe a memory of his involving an encounter, an encounter with the young Voldemort. The exchange is worth quoting in full. You call it greatness. What you have been doing, do you? Asked Dumbledore delicately. Certainly, said Voldemort, and his eyes seemed to burn red. I have experimented. I have pushed the boundaries of magic further, perhaps, than they have ever been pushed. Here, Voldemort is expressing his Nietzschean will to power that seeks to push, its, push the limits of conventional morality and explore the boundaries of power. Dumbledore responds, of some kinds of magic, of some. Of others you remain, forgive me, woefully ignorant. Voldemort, like the Athenians who persecuted and killed Socrates, 
does not know that he merely has the appearance of wisdom, not the reality. The argument continues. For the first time, Voldemort smiled. It was a taut leer, an evil thing, more threatening than a look of rage. The old argument, he said softly. But nothing I've seen in the world has supported your famous pronouncement that love is more powerful than my kind of magic, Dumbledore. Perhaps you've been looking in the wrong places, suggested Dumbledore. Later, in a scene with Harry that clearly parallels this earlier one, Dumbledore explains to Harry that it is through his uncommon skills that he will defeat Lord Voldemort. But I haven't got uncommon skill and power, said Harry, before he could stop himself. Yes, you have, said Dumbledore firmly. You have a power that Voldemort has never had. You can, I know, said Harry impatiently, I can love. It was only with difficulty that he stopped himself from saying, big deal. Yes, Harry, you can love, said Dumbledore, who looked as though he knew perfectly well what Harry had just refrained from saying, which given everything that has happened to you is a great and remarkable thing. You are still too young to understand how unusual you are, Harry. So when the prophecy says that I'll have power the Dark Lord knows not, it just means love? Asked Harry, feeling a little let down. <laughs> yes, just love, said Dumbledore. You are protected by your ability to love, said Dumbledore loudly. Oh. You are protected by your ability to love, said Dumbledore loudly. The only protection that can possibly work against the lure of power like Voldemort's. In spite of all the temptation you have endured, all the suffering, you remain pure of heart, just as pure as you were at the age of 11. When you stared into a mirror that reflected your heart's desire, and it showed you the only way to thwart Lord Voldemort, and not immortality or riches. Harry, have you any idea how few wizards could have seen what you saw in that mirror? Harry had looked into the mirror of Erised, the mirror of desire, that shows to one the deepest desires of one's heart. He did not see the philosopher's stone. Instead, he saw his parents. It is the mirror of his heart, the glass within which he sees darkly what he loves, the mother and father he has never known, the stag and the lily. And again, he is the unicorn. Here, Dumbledore reminds him the purity he saw in that mirror is his own purity of heart. Thus, Dumbledore is engaged in the same old argument with Harry about love that he had earlier had with Voldemort. Both are students of this lover of wisdom. One failed, another still learning, who may yet succeed or fail. The scene takes us back to what Dumbledore had told Harry about his mother's sacrificial love in the first book. The earlier scene that had first placed these two students of Dumbledore in such stark contrast. Voldemort has knowledge of worldly things, but not genuine wisdom. He knows not the power of love. Harry, Dumbledore's other student, has wisdom in his heart that he must remember, the wisdom that is sacrificial love. As the philosopher Pascal put it, the heart has reasons that reason knows not. And Rowling's emphasis upon memory here is crucial. It is reminiscent yet again of St. Augustine's particular answer to the quest for wisdom. He claimed, St. Augustine did, that it is achieved through a kind of recollection or memory in which we discover God who has always loved us, however much we have strayed from him, a love that will help us to put order into our lives and the world around us, wisdom. But Augustine thought this memory involved a constant process of turning within to one's own heart and mind, which Augustine compares to a mirror. If the things of the world are signs that take us to God, how much more so our own hearts and minds made, as scripture tells us, in the image and likeness of God. Remember what you love in your heart and mind, is Augustine's answer. In this mirror within oneself, one sees the image of God that is the heart's greatest desire for Augustine a vision that causes one to remember who and what one is, a being who understands love, understands and loves as God loves, the genuine love of wisdom. 
Dumbledore is constantly reminding Harry to remember, to recollect what he saw in the mirror of Erised, the mirror of desire in which he sees the purity of sacrificial love. Consider again by contrast Nietzsche, who thinks that the single greatest obstacle to the will to power is memory. Success requires what Nietzsche calls creative forgetfulness. Dumbledore has been trying to help Harry recall the purity of love for others that was sealed upon his mind and heart as a baby long before he could ever be conscious of it. The sacrificial love of his mother and father, a love that loves even unto death. Now I want to conclude. <sighs> Heavy sigh. <laughs> now I want to conclude by suggesting that the entire series of books, taken as a whole, is an allegory of the Christian life as the search for wisdom. The course of the entire series. We've seen throughout the books hints of this in the various scenes, packed as they are with symbols and even little allegories taken from Greek philosophy and Christian tradition. But the seventh book really uncovers this allegory, and I'll mention two particular scenes. There's the extraordinary scene of Harry in the graveyard, where he finds the graves of Dumbledore's sister, Ariana, and the graves of his own parents. The scene involves an incredible juxtaposition of symbols. Obviously, we have the graveyard symbolizing death, which is too obvious as a symbol. But the juxtaposition in the scene is with the church. It's Christmas Eve, the eve of the Savior's birth, the Savior who will, of course, die in an act of sacrificial love. So the image is tremendous. Christmas carols are being sung within as Hermione and Harry walk about the graveyard. And the light from within the church is described as coming out through the stained glass windows to illuminate the town square as well as the snow that covers the graveyard. Quote, behind the church, row upon row of snowy tombstones protruded from a blanket of pale blue that was flecked with dazzling red gold and green, wherever the reflections from the stained glass hit the snow. This is an extraordinary construction of a symbol, greater even than what we've seen with the unicorn and the phoenix. Ordinarily, when we think of the stained glass of a church, we think of how the light of the sun outside during the day illuminates the darkness of the church for those within it. But here, it's the light within the church on Christmas Eve that illuminates through the stained glass windows the graveyard in the darkness of night outside the church. It's a reversal. Thus it's a, uh, so, so, thus it's a reversal of the ordinary image. But this darkness of the graveyard that needs illumination, as Harry looks for the graves of his parents and everything else that is going around uh, them, and if you remember all the turmoil of the life they're leading at that point, this darkness of the graveyard that needs illumination as Harry looks for the graves of his parents and everything else that is going on around them can be seen as the dark night of his soul. And when Harry looks upon the two sets of graves, he reads two biblical verses, which by the way, if you watch the movie, they didn't show. The first on Ariana's grave says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also which occurs in both Matthew and Luke. The full passage concerns treasures in heaven. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. In the contrast with early tre earthly treasures, think of the contrast with which the series began, the search for the philosopher's stone that promises untold earthly treasure and power. The second passage is on Harry's parents' tomb. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. This is from Corinthians. The entire passage is, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, 
by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive, but every man in his own order. Christ, the firstfruits. Afterwards, they that are Christ's at his coming. Then cometh the end. When he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father. When he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith, all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is expected, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him, that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. This passage is about the triumph of God over all worldly powers of domination. But the, board, the Christ born on Christmas Eve does so through an act of sacrificial love, not an act of dominating power that destroys for its own glory. Glory to God in the lowest, as Chesterton says. Both passages function to foreshadow the extraordinary scene in which Harry himself walks the way of the king's cross in the climax of the seventh book, in the climax of the entire series. He must be willing to offer himself at King's Cross. Throughout the series, he has learned more and more the way of wisdom from those who have gone before him. Wisdom consists in offering one's life for another. That is the way of freedom from worldly power. That is enlightenment. And when Harry walks that way of the cross, He's freed of the last horcrux. So allow me one last etymology. Horcrux comes from the Latin horere, meaning to dread, and crux, which of course means cross. So the horcrux is the dreaded cross. But through his willingness to walk the way of the king's cross, Harry has learned from all those who have gone before him not to dread this cross. The horcrux has left him. Many people have wondered just what that little shrunken and shriveled baby left behind at King's Cross is. It's the horcrux of Voldemort that had been with Harry since his childhood. It was Harry's own will to power, domination, vengeance, and destruction that is, that is in all of us that Harry leaves behind at King's Cross. If you don't think Harry had such a bad will, a will for death and vengeance, then just recall the end of the sixth book, in which, Harry, in which he leaves Hogwarts swearing vengeance upon those who killed Dumbledore, as if he has forgotten everything Dumbledore ever taught him. In the midst of this forgetfulness, the sec seventh book is about memory of, for any Italian people in there? scholars. L'amor che move il sole e l'altra stelle. The love that moves the sun and the other stars. Sorry about the pronunciation. I saw somebody laughing there and I figured it was on the pronunciation. <laughs> so Harry is not, Harry is not Christ. As I pointed out, there are other symbols of Christ throughout the novels that Harry stands in relation to, so he can't be Christ. No, Harry is all of us. It's the old argument. The Harry Potter novels are for those who have eyes to read, an allegory of the Christian life. What is the love of wisdom? Is it the love of power? Or is it the love we see when we place ourselves at the foot of the king's cross? Today's the memorial of St. Robert Bellamy, and a quotation there is, the school of Christ is the school of love. In the last day when the general examination takes place, love will be the whole syllabus. Thank you.
and thank you for your patience. I understand that was a little long. Sorry about that. And with that, we're now going to open up the floor for questions. So, any takers? Comments? Or comments? Insults? <laughs> yes. All right, well. Uh, back in the context of the series. You got to turn it on. Oh, God. It's on? Oh, hi, everybody. Um, what does this mean for children reading Harry Potter, you know, who might not always get these religious symbols? So, have you found, what, are you, what is your opinion on that? Well, a couple of things. Um, it's fantastic literature. If you were here last week for Professor McInerney's talk, it's in the realm of fantastic literature. And, of course, characteristic of most fantastic literature, whether it's uh, children's uh, literature or adult literature, um, uh, it's packed with symbols, right? And those symbols may not be things that children get, but the point of them is to allow the, the story to introduce children into a way of thinking about the world where they are open to what St. Augustine would say about the world, and that is, it's not just a tree. looking at, thinking about, studying the tree, even in biology, right, in the sorts of things we do, points to something beyond itself. Okay? And that's what a symbol does, point to something beyond. And so it doesn't really matter if, I mean, um, I remember uh, I started reading the novels because my sister-in-law gave two of them to my son before we ever got to check them. And then I started to hear from all these other parents about, oh, you know, evil books about witchcraft and sorcery. How can, you, <laughs> how can you be letting your children read these and so on and so on? And I read the first novel, and I got to that line about there is no good and evil, there's only power in those who are afraid to use it. And I thought to myself, I'm not just going to let my kids read these, I'm going to make my kids read these. <laughs> I mean, I knew from that moment. But of course, my kids, who at the time were probably nine and seven, They'd have no idea where that came from. Nonetheless, it's a powerful statement, right? And so um, this, is, this is what presumably good literature does is it leads you on to something more. And I think um, that's what I would say about children reading it is they should read it. But then, little plug for Catholic education, truly great Catholic education, we should have educations that allow us to develop into readers that can actually understand these things that we read as children, and maybe enjoyed as children, but didn't understand as children. So in that respect, I'd say the Harry Potter novels, they're not just children's books, right? And they're not, they're not four-year-old books either. You don't write, read these to your kids before bed, right? It takes a certain level of maturity in children to read different levels and so on. But I don't think these are just children's books, and that's shown by the extent to which lots of adults you know, would actually read them, not just to see whether their children should read them, but compete with their kids to get a hold of the book so they could finish it. <laughs> so I think it's all to the good to have children reading literature like this. Yes. Uh, rather famously, in, in, in an interview after the last book, J.K. Rowling revealed that uh, she considered Dumbledore to be gay. Does there, is, there any sim, is there any symbolic or philosophical um, explanation we can have for that? I mean, when, when that happened, I didn't see it. I mean, I'll, I'll, I mean, I'll grant you, I was like surprised because I didn't see how that, how that played a role in the story, right? Um, I, I have no reason, I mean, so she's much like Tolkien and Lewis in this regard, especially Tolkien in thinking there's a kind of backstory for all the characters and you're only getting part of it here, right? And so presumably this is part of the backstory, but I wasn't sure exactly after the uh, after you know having read the novels, I read most of them twice, some of them three times. I didn't know where that kind of plays out, how it affects the actual part of the story we're getting now. If she goes back and reads or writes the sort of early life of Dumbledore, maybe we'll get it. But I didn't see how it played a role um, in the actual story we had. So. I don't, you know, I don't know what we're supposed to, what that changes about the story as we experienced it. Uh, 
Uh, I'm sorry, I had a question, but my wife says I can't ask it because I've only seen the movies. <laughs> but if I did ask the question, it would be something like this. That <laughs> and if I did answer it, it would be something like... Um, in the movies, there's no explicit or obvious reference to what we would recognize to be God, but I wonder if you think that the best way I don't know about the only way, but perhaps the best way to make sense of the novels is to kind of hypothesize a God. Or the stories make kind of complete sense without God? Um, well, uh, no, they don't make, uh, certainly the stories don't make sense. Um, I mean, you can't make sense of the church and the graveyard and the scriptural passages. Um, you can't make sense of, of and this they did get in the movie, but I'm told this is probably going to screw up. Oh, no, it's doing that fine, Stephen. <laughs> right? Again, for those with eyes to read, anybody seeing that scene or reading that should remember St. George and the Dragon. Right? I mean, that's St. George and the Dragon. And so even in the movies, they couldn't get rid of this because this is the basis of the entire novel, that particular novel, this scene. They couldn't get rid of that, right? Now, maybe um, in our world, most people won't pick up on that. But hopefully children who have been told about St. George and the Dragon, and even as some children have um, gone around on Halloween as St. George, will actually see that and say, ah, St. George and the Dragon, and what's that about? A princess sa and, and her, her kingdom saved from a dragon by a knight in shining armor who slays a snake or a dragon, but first has to fall into the water to have the wound cleansed of its poison. I mean, you know, if you, if, if you know the legend, you, um, sorry, go back even one more. Only when one knows the story does one know the significance of the picture. Right? You need to know the story, and then you get the picture especially for those of you who just go see movies and don't read books. <laughs> I'll tell a story about this as the end, by the way, but, but I'm happy to take questions so long as people have them. Hi, um, you seem to know a lot about the etymology of these words. This is all I know. And I was... <laughs> <laughs> oh I was wondering if you knew the etymology of Hufflepuff. Um, I looked it up once. I looked it up once, and I can't remember what it is. Do you know it? I, I do not. That's why I asked. <laughs> no, I, I looked it up, and um, anybody? I. What's that? <laughs> yeah. But I, I honestly, I can't remember what it is. At a certain point, uh, the great thing that happened to me once was my mother, mother worked in a library, and libraries oftentimes get rid of the most important books. Um, kind of like naming a book about sorcerers rather than philosophers because some people in these libraries don't think that people read important books, so you put them out on the leavings table over there in the Hesburg. You can get lots of really good books. My mother picked up a book. Uh, it was published in the late 50s. The Oxford um, Encyclopedia of Religious Symbols. I had that sitting on my, my um, uh, bookcase for probably 15 years. And then I start reading these novels, and I'm like, I mean, I knew the Phoenix, I knew the Griffin, those were sort of straightforward. Uh, but there's some other ones where you're like, you don't realize what that is. The Stag. There's a really wonderful novel about the priesthood called Mort Durban. If, you've ever, if you could read it, it's a great novel. And in it, there's a, there's a scene of a businessman fishing in Minnesota who, find, who um, sees a stag on the side of the water and he's a businessman that gives lots of money to the church and to the universities that are run by the church. And in the scene, the businessman is shown rowing up very carefully to the stag, grabbing it by its antlers, and pulling the stag's head down into the water to drown it. Okay, what's that a symbol of? He's killing the church. Because a stag next to the waters and medieval symbolism is a symbol of the church. So the businessman is drowning the church. 
It's a wonderful use of an image in a book that isn't a fantastic novel. It's not a novel in fantasy, but it's a symbol. So, I mean, I'd say look all that stuff up. Anytime you read a work that's in the genre of fantasy, now you can do this with the iPhones, look the symbols up. And you'd be surprised at what the heck's going on. You got the thing. Professor, I was curious if you could talk more about memory. Uh, yeah. That was something that wasn't and, and, and explicitly imagination as a literary use, but also understood religiously how it connects, you know, with this being specifically, I mean, but not completely a, a children's kind of story, but how that, you know, memory relates to, you know, delving into these religious themes. Well, um, so a quick little thing. The end is always in the beginning. If you want to understand the end, you've got to understand the beginning. And of course, you see that in scripture. Genesis, in the beginning, tells you about the beginning. Before the time when anybody presumably could recall, right? and nonetheless, in the beginning. John, the Gospel of John, in the beginning, was the logos. Right? So the Gospel of John, which comes after Genesis, takes you back to Genesis and helps you understand Genesis. That there's a beginning before the beginning of Genesis, and it's the Logos, who was with God and who is God, and through him all things were made, which is what Genesis is about. So you see this biblical arc of going back. If you want to understand where we're going, you have to go back. And that's memory. What happens to Harry throughout the novels? Now, it gets a little bit out of hand, uh, with the Ponciev, um, is that in the sixth book, right? Um, where uh, Dumbledore, you get, keep getting all the little memories. It's almost as if Rowling realized she didn't have enough time left to get all the, sto the back story out. But from the very beginning of the novels, as they progress, what happens to Harry? He learns more and more about that primeval event that led to where they are now. So he has to keep going back and understanding that. That's memory. Okay. Well, this, again, is a kind of theme. In Western literature, it goes back to Plato, specifically, in a dialogue called the Mino, where he thought understanding is always brought about by a kind of recollection of reality. The reality isn't absent. You are absent from the reality. And so by memory, recollection, you place yourself back in the presence of the reality. What St. Augustine does with that, and it's very explicit in relationship to Plato, Plato thought it was a kind of pre-existence. Pre St. Augustine doesn't think it's pre-existence. St. Augustine, in a way, thinks ignorance and sin consist in forgetting. God is always present. Think of the Jews in the Old Testament. God is always there. The story is a story of forgetfulness. So how do you return to God? By recollection. So Augustine sort of, that's any of you, the confessions. The confessions is an exercise in memory. If any of you go to confession, that's an exercise in memory. Understanding yourself by remembering what you've done. Um, and that becomes Dante, right? He tells the tale of coming back to something, having forgotten something. Midway in, the course of my, uh, midway in the course of life, I found myself in a dark wood. That dark wood is forgetfulness. And so what's the divine comedy? Memory. Um, just, uh, again, as you read certain sorts of literature, pay attention to, anybody, we're talking about this at dinner, see the movie Tree of Life? Memory. That memory takes you back to the moment of creation, if you've seen the movie. You're not going to understand suffering if you don't understand that. Remember the music in the moment of creation? Lacrima vale. The music is lacrimosa. God is weeping in the creation. In the beginning were the tears. That's how to understand suffering. Recollection. So whenever you read a book, if you see a kind of moving forward that's always looking backward in the way in which it moves forward, that's this theme of recollection. You need to recollect, recall, 
Remember who you are. My mother always said that to me when I would go out in high school. Uh, you mentioned a lot about how that Harry is not Jesus or symbolizing Christ because of the other symbols, yeah. but he symbolizes us. Can you clarify on that a little bit more? Well, um, Harry's, Harry has to learn something, right? He has to progress. I think the most significant way in which he's not Christ is he himself has to go to the King's Cross, which is already there. I mean, that was one of the funniest things. And frankly, when I saw that that was the title of the novel, I said, I've been right all along. This is what this series is about. It's about learning to go to the foot of the cross, which is an allegory of the Christian life. And that's what Christians are taught they have to do. Learn how to go to the foot of Christ's cross, the King's cross. And so it's because he has to go to that cross, I think most significantly, that you would say, well, he's not Christ. He's us. That's why he's an allegorical figure for us. All of us have to learn to do what he did. Does that help? Uh, hello. I wondered if I might um, put something out that might complicate a bit the sort of distinction you've he's made. He's a graduate student in philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> between the philosophy of Voldemort on the one hand and Harry Potter on the other. Because some people, even who are um, quite enthusiastic about the novels, have noticed that some of the heroes, uh, Harry and more seriously Dumbledore, some, sometimes they seem to utilize sort of a sort of consequentialist or ends justify the means reasoning in certain regards. So a minor example would be Harry and his friends are frequently lying and breaking rules to, for the greater good. But more seriously, I think people look at um, the sort of uh, assisted suicide of Dumbledore in some ways to transfer his wand to Snape. Now, in the context of the story, that actually ends up backfiring. So one might say the story doesn't justify that kind of decision. But it still is something that seems to tarnish Dumbledore in that he seems to resort to something that in kind of uh, Thomistic or Catholic morality would seem to be uh, an intrinsically wrong way of going about things. So I wondered what, if you might say something about well, in that. Well, the, in the case, uh, I mean, so there's a kind of point about the literature of it, and that is, in the case of Harry and his friends, they're little kids. And little kids lie when they get themselves into trouble. What's crucial is that when Harry goes to the cross, that's all gone. He just goes. He's no longer sort of looking for a way out, which is what a lie does. Right? A lie is a way out without having to sacrifice. And so that, that aspect of it didn't bother me at all. I mean, when people first brought this up, oh, hero of a novel, he lies. He's eight years old and he spent most of his life in a closet. <laughs> Where is he going to have learned not to lie to get out of a difficult situation? So in those cases, it doesn't bother me. I, I didn't know, and I probably still don't know what to think about um, Dumbledore and um, that. Um, but I think we have to be careful that we not too closely analyze stories first in terms of moral doctrine. Because the stories in the first place, as Professor McInerney pointed out last week, are sto stories. Stories are stories of development of moral character. And that, that Dumbledore would, in, would do something that from a Catholic perspective, according to the law, would be wrong. Well, Dumbledore's not Christ either. And he's not the one. I mean, Dumbledore's the one preparing Harry. Harry's the one that goes to the cross, not Dumbledore. Think of the apostles. I was talking about this today in class. Right? Here is John. Right? The rest of the apostles, the rest of the apostles committed what Dante portrays as the worst of all possible evils. Betrayal. At least in some form or another. Judas most um, obviously. But the rest of them, right? What did they do? Peter, the rock upon which the church is founded, 
denied Christ. That violates Catholic teaching in a way worse, probably, than even Dumbledore. Right? He denied Christ three times. And yet, Christ, knowing he would deny him three times, chose him to be the rock upon which he would build the church. So the failures of people, I think that's part of the story. It's part of the sto- these stories, and it's part of our story. How many times have we failed and nonetheless known that we failed? And there's to a certain extent there, uh, taking it out of the Catholic sort of moral vision point, there's also a certain kind of um, um, waving to Greek tragedy that she's doing there, the unavoidable tragedy. He, they can't get out of it. Necessity requires it. So there's a little bit of a literary thing going on there too. But I, you know, I mean, so... <sighs> Dumbledore's not perfect. He's not Christ. And Harry is the one that goes to the cross, not Dumbledore. And in fact, Dumbledore suggests at a certain point why he can't. He's not the one because of what he had done as a youth, if I remember that part of the story. So. All right, that's going to conclude our lecture for tonight. Does Thank anybody want to hear about that? Oh, yeah. So unicorn, what's that? That's not Harry, no. <laughs> this is a tapestry in the Museum of the Middle Ages in Paris. Oh, yeah, purity, but Christ. Lap, what's Mary holding? And what's in the mirror? No, not desire. What's in the mirror? The Eucharist. What's she holding? A monstrance. Only when you know the story do you know the significance of the picture. Thank you very much.